If you've ever gone to make a small change in your Unity project and found yourself editing half a dozen scripts, you've run into a code smell. Problems like shotgun surgery, switch statements, temporary fields, and refused bequest can sneak in early and quietly and make your code harder to change. In this video, we'll spot those troublemakers in Unity projects and refactor them into cleaner, safer designs so that you can make changes quickly without breaking everything else. These examples are inspired by Martin Fowler's refactoring book and adapted here for Unity and C Sharp. Let's get into it. Okay, let's have a look at a code smell called temporary field, which I know that almost all of us have been guilty of at some time or another. You see this where data only exists in an object under certain conditions, and the rest of the time it just sits there unused. In Unity, this often shows up as serialized fields that are null on most prefabs, forcing us to scatter null checks and cluttering up the inspector. Consider a scenario like this where the player occasionally has a special item they can use to attack with, but most of the time they just have their normal attack. More than half of the code in the player class is dedicated to handling this special item that most of the time isn't present. Step one is to identify the cluster. We've got several public fields and two methods that are used exclusively for the special. In Rider, the easy way to handle this is use the refactor this command and extract class. If you can't remember the shortcut, you can grab it from the top menu under refactor, grab extract class, and here you can just check off the different items you want to move. So I'm gonna grab those three fields, and then a little lower, I'm going to select the two methods that we want. You'll see right away, I get a little warning icon. That's because the accessibility isn't quite correct on those, they're both private methods. Let's change them to be public. And then of course you need to give your class a new name and you need to choose a name to reference the new instance of your new class as well. Let's look at the new class. Special attack owns the item, the cooldown, and the last used timestamp. We can use the class with the two methods that we extracted, but we can take this a little bit further. Let's use the refactor this command again to extract an interface. This way we could substitute our special attack with a test class or any variation of a special attack we want. I'll just select the two methods we want to include in the interface, and there we go. We can continue to clean up this code a lot because the special attack knows about the special item it's going to use in the attack. We don't need to pass it into the use special signature. Again, let's use refactor this and change signature. Here, just remove item from the signature and click next. Inside of the use special method, we could just use the special item because it's a member of this class. On top of that, it's my preference to cut down visual clutter as much as possible. We don't need the word special in the method names and the class names. Let's just rename this to can use, and we can rename the other method to just use. Now that we've extracted our special attack, we can make our player class even simpler. We can remove the null check here, and instead we just check to see if we can use the special attack, and if so, we use it. Otherwise, we just use the basic attack. We can also reference our special attack using the interface. This way we can replace it with a different kind of special attack anytime we want. Now, we still are doing a null check in the can use method of our special attack. We could get around that by using the null object programming pattern. If we create a null object type of special attack, where can use just returns false and use does nothing, we could default our player to have no special attack. When they pick up an item or so on in the game, then we populate the special attack with whatever's appropriate. So at this point, we've successfully refactored away from the temporary field code smell. And in the future, we can define any type of special attack that we want. Our player class is nice and clean, and we've eliminated some of the conditional logic and null checks inside of the attack method. So once again, temporary field is a code smell where an object holds data it only needs in certain situations, leaving it unused or null the rest of the time. Okay, the next code smell we're going to look at is the switch statement. And of course, any long list of conditional statements falls under this umbrella. Anytime you see a list of if this, else if this, else if this, else do something else, or maybe you just see it as a switch statement, as a rule of thumb, when you see the switch, you should think of polymorphism. In well-structured, object-oriented code, switch statements are used sparingly, but when they do appear, their cases are often spread across different parts of your code base. So adding a new condition means tracking down and updating every single one. Now, here we're only looking at one class, but you can imagine most games that deal with multiple enemy types likely have to check that in multiple places. There are a few different refactorings you can do, but start with this. Find an instance in your code base where this is happening and isolate that into its own method. So again, I'll use the refactor this and extract method. 
give it some kind of meaningful name, and click Next. Now that the behavior is isolated to one method, we can introduce an interface where that is the only method, for now at least, and our enemy can now store a reference to an enemy behavior. Now at this point you have a few choices to make, but let's suppose that we make the enemy behavior a component on the same game object. We can get a reference to that in the awake method. Then we can modify our update method to actually call the tick method that belongs to our behavior. Now the tick method of our enemy class and everything below it is actually obsolete. Let's delete it. Instead what we can do is use composition to add unique behaviors to each of our enemy prefabs. So a flying enemy could have a flying enemy component. And likewise we could do the same for the ground enemies. And maybe we have different behavior for boss enemies. Of course they don't have to be mono behaviors. You could do this with scriptable objects or just pure C sharp classes. Now one thing that we've lost by extracting these behaviors away from the enemy class is we don't actually have a reference to information about the enemy itself. So let's come back to the interface and change the signature of the tick method. Let's add a new parameter of type enemy. You can name it anything you want. Of course enemy probably makes the most sense. And then click next. The change signature feature in Rider has a really nice option where you can specify that you want to update all of the calls. So if I say that when we call the tick method, we're going to pass in this, notice that not only does it change the call inside the enemy class, but it changes all of the instances of my different I enemy behavior concrete implementations. Now each of these different behaviors will have a reference to the enemy it's associated with. Now there's something else worth mentioning about the switch statement code smell. It's not always a candidate for refactoring. There are two main scenarios where it's not worth refactoring. It doesn't make any sense. Let's suppose that you had a switch statement based on direction. This is so simple and probably unique to the place that you're using it in that refactoring it into its own object doesn't really make sense. The other scenario is when you have a factory or an abstract factory because the factory itself is responsible for producing different types of an object. In fact, this code here is both an example of a switch statement on an extremely simple object and a factory that returns vector threes. Shotgun surgery is a code smell where a single change to your program requires making small edits in many different classes or files. In this example, the player decides critical hits with a little inline formula. The enemy does almost the same thing, but with a tiny twist for threat. The tooltip does it again to show a percentage. Three places, three slightly different versions of the same rule. This is a code smell because one gameplay decision, what's the crit chance, is scattered across multiple classes. If design wants to tweak the base rate or we add difficulty scaling, you now have to hunt through player, enemy, UI, and possibly more classes, hoping that you don't miss one. These are all a little bit different, so you can't just find and replace, and it slows us down. A simple change turns into a commit that touches multiple files, risks merge conflicts, and makes reviews noisy. Worse, each site starts to grow its own exceptions. Clamps here, multipliers there, until no one knows the true rule anymore. The goal is simple, one source of truth. So let's create an interface that will represent the policy that we're gonna have to represent crit chance across our entire game. Let's give it two methods, one that would calculate our actual crit chance, and another one that can return true or false to simulate an actual roll. We might have more than one type of crit policy, so let's move this into its own file here. And we'll just define one to begin with. I'll just call it crit policy, but you might have a linear crit policy or something else. We can define a base rate and we might want to cache different policies based on different base rates so that we don't have to create a new one every time. We can have a private constructor that would set that base rate and then we'll implement those interface methods. The chance method will calculate the final crit chance by multiplying the base rate, the attacker's luck, and a multiplier, and then clamp the result between zero and one. The roll method will actually perform the roll, so it can grab a random value between 0 and 1 and return true if that value is less than the calculated crit chance. Now, the reason that I made the constructor private is because we can have a static factory method. We can use this to get a crit policy without worrying about how it's created or cached. It can default to a 5% base rate if we don't pass one in. We can first check the dictionary to see if we've already made a policy with this base rate. If not, we create a new one and store that policy in the dictionary so we can reuse it next time. Finally, return the policy instance, either the one we created or the one we pulled from the cache. Now that we have a single source of truth for calculating and rolling crits, let's come back to the other classes in our game and make sure that they all use the same policy. This way, if we ever change how crits work, we make the change in one place and the entire game will update automatically. 
So in the player class, we'll just comment out the old line, and instead we'll call the static factory method from the crit policy, and we can just inline the role right there. Next, if we come down to the enemy, we can actually comment out these first three lines. In this case, the enemy's luck value is dependent upon the amount of threat they have. So let's calculate that first, but then we use the crit policy in exactly the same way. Now, in this case, that local function isn't doing anything very complex. It might be worthwhile considering just inlining that as well. Or if it's more complex and you need to use it in more than one place, it might be worth extracting this into its own policy. Finally, down in the tooltip, I'll just comment out our duplicated formula. Here, we don't need to roll. We can just call the public chance method. Now, everything's been refactored. Let's just remove all the code that we commented out. There we go. Nice and clean. One source of truth for all of these calculations. Now, let's just quickly jump over to the crit policy one more time, because usually when we see a method that says create, it implies that we're creating a new object every time. And that's not really the case with the way that we've set things up in the caching. A better name for this method is actually get. I'll just use F2 to do a safe rename across the project. Now, I know this example was extremely simple, and a lot of you have the shotgun surgery code smell in your much larger and complex projects. I personally think this is one of the most valuable code smells to tackle at any stage of your project because fixing it pays off immediately and continues to save you time and reduce bugs as your code base grows. This next code smell is called refused bequest. A bequest is something that's handed down or inherited. Most often we use that word in the context of receiving property or money from somebody in a will. But in object-oriented programming, this is when a subclass is being forced to inherit fields and methods that it doesn't need. Not only does this clutter up your class, but it can mislead other developers or future you into thinking that a method works when it really doesn't. And every time you change the base class, you risk breaking unrelated subclasses. A big red flag to look for in code review is when you see the throw new not implemented exception. The ground speed public member in the base class is also a red flag because it's defined in the base class, but not all subclasses actually use it. Our base class is suitable for ground enemies that have to walk around, but anything related to ground speed or walking isn't actually implemented in the flying enemy. Usually the fix for this code smell is to move away from inheritance and start using composition. Let's introduce a new interface so we can abstract away the movement. And while we're at it, why don't we do the same thing for attack? For our grounded enemies, we could have a mover component specific to moving along the ground, and the flying enemies will have their own mover component. Now we don't need a flying enemy class. And in fact, we don't need an abstract base class either. Let's rename enemy base to be enemy. We can remove the ground speed member because that's now handled by another component. Instead, let's replace that with a reference to an I movement component, and let's add a reference to our I attack component. In our awake method, we can get the references to those components. And then maybe in update, we just call our movers move method. Our attack method can now call the attack execute method. And if we want to have some error checking, we could add an on validate method that could just make sure that we have some instance of an I movement and an I attack component on the game object. If not, give ourselves a little error in the log. Of course, there are other ways to handle this, such as using Odin Validator or one of the homebrewed solutions we've cooked up on this channel before, such as serialized interface or icons in the hierarchy. But I think that's enough refactoring for one day. Hope that you found that useful. Once again, all the refactorings that I've talked about today actually come from a book called Refactoring that was written by Martin Fowler over two decades ago. But its principles still hold true. A lot of people still swear by it, including myself. Now, if you're like me and you have to read and review a lot of code every day, these kinds of things become second nature. But it's always good to be able to put a name to the code smell and consider what the possible solutions would be so that when you're discussing this with your teammates or just by yourself, you're able to come up with good solutions that will help future-proof your project. Because remember, the purpose of refactoring and the purpose of following software engineering principles while you're writing code is to facilitate change. Most projects have to change as they develop. You're going to want to change it. Your players want to change it. Your publisher is going to want to change it. So make it easy to change. And with that said, I'll just say hit the bell for a new video every Sunday about Unity C Sharp programming. Join us on Discord if you like. I'll throw another video up on the screen. Maybe I'll see you there.